the woman with the lowest Dunedin pace, or so you were when I reached out to you. Since then, some things happened. Yeah, I have a fresh start, a rebrand, a relaunch, and I'm kind of, I'm excited about it, actually. On that note, let's rebrand you. <laughs> so you, you have quite, uh, quite awesome results. The need and pace of 0 0.6. Uh, may I ask your chronological age as well? I'm 63. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. Well, then that's, that's much more impressive. You know, like as I saw, or I could identify the, the girls who got in front of you in the rejuvenation Olympics, they were young, not just younger, but like young, young. So, wow. All right. So what's your secret? <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, I think, I think the answer to that is like, we don't really know, you know, this is all so new and it's really exciting and super fun. Um, back in 2022, I was lucky enough to connect with Ryan over at True Diagnostics. I saw you had him on your channel. I was so lucky. Uh, he's such a knowledgeable guy. And they sent me a test and I took it just two years ago. And it, it was about like a 0.73, which I thought, oh, you know, hey, you know. And then just this year, just earlier this year, I took it and it came back up 0 0.60, which was really amazing, you know, that it, so I had been able to slow it down quite a bit more in two years. Um, I can tell you what I do. I, I don't know. I mean, I have some guesses about may, what may, might be the top contenders for, you know, slowing aging or, you know, keeping that pace slower. Um, I would think that number one would be exercise movement. It's something that I have done every decade of my life. And it's just the most consistent thing that I've always done. I mean, if we go back like to the 90s or something like that, I don't think my diet was great. I mean, I think it was probably above average. And so my diet has gotten better over time. But um, I think exercise might be at the top. All right, we will figure that out. <laughs> but one major thing that leads people to, to, to have great results in terms of their health is their mindset. Um, from a philosophical, spiritual, maybe re religious point of view, where are you coming from? That's such a good question. Um, so for my work, I'm a licensed uh, clinical psychotherapist. So for the last 25 years, um, I witness people's lives, I support them and, you know, do therapy with people. I feel like that might be part of some of the mix or whatever of, you know, my whole picture, my story. Um, helping people heal it, it it's very gratifying work I, I i'm sure we both know a lot of people who really hate their work and i've really been able to do what i love although it can be hard i've never not loved it so you know it's amazing and it kind of it kind of goes both ways you know so i'm 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 offering healing but i feel like there's good in that for me, just in that process of sharing that with people. Um, so it's pretty amazing. In terms of like the big questions, um, why are we here and the larger meaning? And um, for me, I, I look at it in this way. I don't feel the need to know. I don't feel the need to pin down things that are bigger than me. I just try to be open to kind of like any possibility. Um, and, you know, I you know, don't usually use this word for myself, but if you're going to ask that question, I consider myself a seeker. 
you know, I think that's true in my rejuvenation practices too. It's like, you know, always looking for more information and like looking at, you know, listening to the studies and, oh, you know, trying this out or that out, but also thought experiments and people's ideas. And I think uh, culturally religion is interesting. I did go to a Jesuit university, so that was cool and interesting. But I mean, I'm not really keen on organized religion, but that's because humans can be corrupt and horrible. But um, personally, my philosophy is I, I, I try to focus on my world, what's in front of me, certainly being a strong mom for my sons and, you know, being a good friend and helping patients in my work and focusing on what I can do in my own purview here. And I feel like that's very meaningful and has an impact. And yeah. So, so your, your mind is more around you rather than everyone else regarding consciousness. Consciousness must always be occupied with something. Right? It's like there is a question that where is your consciousness? Mm. Because it, it can, it's not really clear that your consciousness is really inside your brain or whatever, but it might actually be spaceless. Like consciousness can be always, must be always occupied with something. It's called aboutedness, it must be always about something. So if you're driving a car, then you, you kind of become the car itself. <laughs> it's really strange. Um, now, what, what my question was, my question was that, was it even a question that your, your mind is, is occupied with things. Those are more relevant to what you are than let's say politics or, or other big things, other people think about mm, that be yeah correct I, I think that's a good observation yeah I feel like I I like to put my energy where I am good and where I know that I can have an impact and yeah it's interesting I I, I uh, yeah I enjoyed hearing your thoughts on that yeah I my my work is so interesting because I do just like this, you know, I talk with someone just like I'm talking with you and then get to hear their thoughts and be enjoying their mind with them. And so it's kind of a continual mind experiment and expansion and just one person at a time, I guess. I guess I'm just, you know, working on more of the micro instead of the macro. That's a little overwhelming for me to think about like politics and that kind of thing. It's awful, awful big to take on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How, how much this strategy of sh shortening shortening your time preference or yeah i think that's how it's called that uh, when when someone's life is in chaos then the best thing to do is to focus on the next steps because you can always handle what's in front of you and you don't have to think of any of many things so do you is is that what you're doing you're meeting with people who are whose whose life is in in complete chaos and you have to somehow have them put them together that can be i mean that certainly describes somebody who's really in a trauma reaction or a post trauma reaction and that's certainly something that i work with a lot what's nice is that I do really long-term work with people. So I've had people, you know, in treatment with me for, you know, years or they'll pop in and out with different life occurrences. And so sometimes it's not as heavy and it can be more expansive and wandering and helping them kind of um, get beyond something like that of like, okay, I just need to manage and cope and get to the next thing, but more to like, okay, well, if there's some breathing room, what can we What's coming up? What you can think of? What can you think about? Um, you know, kind of. That's the idea of therapy as developmental. You know, something that we 
perhaps didn't get earlier in life, in childhood, because there was trauma, because there was just not available resources or whatever the case may be. But adulthood is for the, that kind of development. So I think about myself like helping people continue their development. But you're right, like we got to get out of the traumatic response sort of you know, that has to be dealt with first. Okay, one last question regarding your your work. People often become doctors or, or go on that path because even, even either them or someone in their close proximity is suffering from an illness, let's say. And people say that if you go on a path like you, then that might be because you or someone in your close proximity uh, was having some problems. Oh, 100%. So, yeah, that's most therapists. Yeah, 100%. You're saying <laughs> that a therapist might go into the profession because they, they, they have want to solve their own issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that the case? Oh, very much so. Yeah, yeah. Childhood for me was a very, very dark and lonely and difficult space. So how so? You know, my my childhood was was full of um, uh, just briefly. You know, my mom was a sort of a tragic alcoholic who left the family. Um, myself and my brothers when we were very young and left, left us with our dad. And, um, and then she would come back into my life chaotically here and there. But um, I was very unusual, you know, at that time for a sort of bachelor father. My dad was a blue collar, you know, welder by no means, um, you know, sort of, you know, lower middle class. And um, so in, in essence, what happened was that my brothers and myself ended up sort of raising, raising, raising ourselves. Um, so childhood was scary, and it was lonely and barren is the word that I use, you know. And like I said, um, you know, my mom would, there would be tries again to have a relationship with her mom, but she was pretty tragically alcoholic for most of, you know, for all of my growing up. Um, so, um, yeah, one of the ways I coped was I wanted to go to college and I wor worked really hard to pursue that, even though nobody in my family ever even talked about it. And I was able to get a really nice scholarship and go to a, a really lovely, um, university, Santa Clara university here in the Bay area, which is pretty lucky. And then after college and doing some, some work in publishing, I um, I started doing my own, you know, therapy as a client, and that would be, you know, that would I would have a lot a lot of years of therapy. And my my first therapist therapist was so amazing and influential on me, and sort of a mother presence in my life that you know I I was so influenced that you know I decided that I would really you know love to do what she did and. And ended up pursuing my graduate degree and then going in and then um, myself working with traumatized kids. Like when I was an intern, I worked with the, the littlest of little and did a lot of play therapy and work with kids who were very, very difficult situations. So, yeah, I think that's what I was maybe referring to when I was saying the healing kind of goes both ways. You know, I certainly strongly believe that a clinician needs to do their own work. People buy, you know, expensive cars and chase, you know, that lifestyle creep. And I put a lot of money into therapy <laughs> because it, you know, was necessary for myself as I was training, as I was, you know, and as I was a therapist myself, you know, I continue, I guess, maybe, you know, finding what made sense for me out of all of that um, is healing in and of itself. And it's very, you know, it is very gratifying to be there for someone in a way that 
would have been amazing in the 70s, 70s and 80s, you know, at least in my microcosm. The only mention of a therapist would have been if you were quote unquote crazy, you would go to see a psychiatrist for medication. There wasn't just this like, I, I'm in California, so it's very like everybody has a therapist, you know, but it wasn't like that back then. And we didn't talk about things openly. And so, you know, struggling as a teenager, all the things that one struggles with and no benefit of, of talking to anybody. I love working with my adolescents and young adults, and really all through the lifespan. But yeah, it, it makes sense. Let's pick it up from there. What other things happened after college? <laughs> I, I have to improve my broken Eastern European accent. So what, what happened after college um, that's not related to your, to your work stuff? Let's say, let's say family or what put you on the path? path. Um, yeah, what put me on the path just sort of like focusing on health. And I married very young. I married my kid's dad very young. I was only 20, um, which was, again, like normal in my circle. Just really odd. The, the thing I didn't do that all my friends were doing was having children very young. I did not do that. We decided instead to pursue degrees. And so we, we kid, my kid's dad and myself both got our bachelor's degrees, you know, a working married couple supporting ourselves through college. And then I wanted to continue and go to graduate school. And so I did that. Then I wanted to uh, event. I finally wanted to have children. I, I, you know, it took me a while to get some some things I really wanted to do done. And then I had a real strong desire to have children. And unfortunately, had a lot of trouble. I had a long um, series of um, miscarriages, and. Um, you know, it could have been some of that could have been my early, I think I've always been really interested in my body and health and all of that. But that that loss of control wasn't something that I, you know, just took lightly. I really wanted to solve it. And I really wanted to figure out, you know, what's going on. And well, it did get solved. I have two, you know, healthy children. But the pursuit of, you know, going to full term and, and, and all of that was I was had to be very, you know, tenacious. And there were a lot of, you know, I was giving myself um, injections of progesterone every day, because it, there was some thought about, you know, science was only so far in the mid to late 90s. And there was some thought about, you know, I needed more progesterone. And um, who knows if that was it, because we don't know. But um, I was able to have my sons, and that was concurrent with sitting for my boards, for my clinical boards. So I was nine months pregnant with my oldest when I sat for boards. At that time, when you sat for your license, you had to sit in front of three clinicians and defend a case. Um, it was quite the big deal. I'm actually disappointed that they don't do that anymore because I feel like the profession is perhaps not as good as it used to be or not as, um, doesn't vet as well. Um, but, um, so I sort of concurrently launched my practice and started having children, um, at around the same time. Uh, and then I, you know, just to finish that story, ended up, um, divorcing my boy's dad and which, you know, was a good thing for me. Um, and we, you know, got married very young and that was okay. It wasn't something that, I wanted to continue, um, but so raised my two sons mostly as a single mom. Well, I mean, as a single mom, they did have a little bit of time with their dad, but um, I did most of it, which I absolutely adored. And um, I have a Gen Z and a millennial, a young millennial. Um, yeah, they're they're like, you know, of course, two of my favorite people on the planet. I think it was, you know, it was around the the 2010s, the early 2010s that I really started to get interested in the whole biohacking movement and, you know, Dave Asprey and 
intermittent fasting and Tim Ferriss and, you know, just started really like listening to all these ideas um, and started adopting things. I was really, really big into yoga and, you know, that kind of went along with it too. But yeah, and I think, you know, um, this science has just gotten really interesting and and developed more and more since then. I definitely hopped on the whole um, David Sinclair idea, although I, I never really took gads of uh, of NMN. I, I just really can't get behind that. I'm not extremist in anything, so if I, you know, the supplements I do take, um, I, I don't take, I don't take a lot. I, I definitely do take some, but um, yeah, the 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 really, you know, the you know, the idea of metformin, rapamycin, you know, these things feel a little. Um, I mean, I know there's science behind them and, and stuff, but I worry about the you know effects of those things sort of like that the body is this has this ability to find its homeostasis and if we're hitting our you know hitting something with a hammer just one part of it so hard you know is that not going to throw other things off and what do we what do we know i know it's all experimental um really at some at the end of the day an experiment of one, um, but I'm pretty, um, you know, I'm pretty cautious with the, the things that I try. Or maybe I'm not. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I think I am. I don't think I've done anything too extreme. All right. Let's 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 start with things that you did not do instead of the things that you did do. Because half the success is the things that the bad things that you avoid, right? Uh, like, do you have any bad habits, bad results, or vices? Uh, yeah, in childhood, I um, this was this was the culture that I grew up in. I, um, you know, didn't didn't have the parental, you know, um, I don't even want to say guidance. I didn't have the parental. Um, presence at home so um smoking at like 12 13 this the 70s we smoked a lot of weed i mean luckily that was it um i didn't go into heavier drugs at all and since i had that sort of um, bad experience trauma with my mom I didn't drink any alcohol at all. It was almost, I had like an aversion to it. So that may be one thing that I've, you know, I did like at the, at the age of 49 started, you know, just dabbling. I live in wine country, Northern California, sort of dabbling a little bit with wine with friends and stuff. And I, I do love a little bit of wine, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't drink very much. So I did save, you know, I certainly wasn't, you know, doing 20s, 30s, 40s. I wasn't drinking at all. Um, and then I did quit smoking at a pretty young age. So um, I've been told that that's all, you know, like, uh, in fact, I think it showed up on my test that I, there's no signs. That I, I, I think there's a metric for that on the um, true diagnostic, diagnostic yes. test. Yeah. It showed up on mine that there are no signs. Oh, that's good. Even though there should be. <laughs> there should be. Yeah. So that's relieving to know that we the body heals. That's so wonderful. <laughs> uh, I, I hear you're not supposed to, you know, how there's a book out there, something about like 10 ways not to die. And um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't drive real fast. And I don't hang around with people who are, you know, doing drug deals or something. That's also very dangerous, I hear. Um, at about 18, I started like exercise, maybe a little obsessive. Oh, well, and another thing I didn't do <laughs> at about the age of 16 to around 22 is I didn't eat much. I was pretty anorexic, pretty, 
pretty severe. Like clinically or just? Clinically, not that anybody was paying attention, but um, I stopped having periods. I was um, visibly like uh -huh. starving myself. And I know I was starving myself. I, I counted my calories every day for all those years. It was a coping mechanism. So when they, it's odd because when they talk about calorie restriction, I'm like, well, yeah, I'm a big one on that. Yeah, that's. Uh, I wonder if there is anything to do with that. It's curious. Hmm. Yeah, it's curious. Yeah. Although you made a big improvement last year, right? Right. So I I don't think that was calorie restriction, was, was it? Um. Well. I'm not a big person, and in order to basically maintain my weight, I mean, I don't know if this is calorie restriction or not, but um, I eat about, you know, 1,500 calories a day. So I track calories, and I eat a lot. So it could be. I have a I, – I, I don't eat perfect uh, at all, uh, but – there's a lot of thought that goes into it and uh, you know it's it's pretty controlled in the sense that it's pretty much everything i eat is what i make and pick and you know hand select and, and you know trying to tell me about your nutrition philosophy yeah i i try to eat whole foods and of course some minimally processed foods minimally processed meaning like you know i'll have some the rice crackers that I get have, you know, flaxseed. They're made with, made with olive oil instead of canola oil. And they, you know, it's no, nothing horrible. It's obviously processed. I am gluten-free. I did go gluten and most grain-free 10 years ago. And I'm not celiac, but I actually really don't, don't do well on gluten. I think it actually caused a lot of problems for me. Um, so that's been a good thing. And so that cuts out a lot. If you're, if you're gluten-free and mostly grain-free, it, it, it cuts a lot out. I can do, I do a little bit of rice. I try not to eat you know, too much of it. Um, so it's whole foods. I, um, I try to optimize protein, but I don't think that I get maybe more than, it's probably between 80 and 100 grams a day. You know, technically, I'm probably supposed to have like 140 or something like that. But I do track my lean body mass and, you know, with what I intake, I do, I do like hydrolyzed collagen and, and with what I do take in, I'm, I'm able to, you know, I've been able to make some gains this year with lean body mass and a little bit of shaving off of fat mass. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm obviously getting what I need in, in terms of protein. I love espresso. So as my espresso that I make myself is like a really integral part of my day. And um, that's like a treat. And I believe there's space for like having what you what you love. And like I said, I'm not going to turn down uh, a glass of wine with a girlfriend. It just doesn't, you know, once or twice a month, you know, and then otherwise I'm Oh, I just went to Ren Fair. It's Ren Fair time here. And I had some cider, of course. You know, cider, hard cider is gluten free. It's amazing. Um, Wait, you also consider espresso unhealthy food? Um, I, no, I, I think it's amazing. Um, I, I think maybe <laughs> some people do. Some people try to cut out caffeine. I, I, I wouldn't mm -hmm. want to do that. But if, if it weren't for espresso, like if I'm out somewhere or, or away from home and all someone has is just like a regular drip coffee, I'll be like, I'm good. You know, I just, it's just about it's just about that espresso. It's a little bit of a yeah, obsession, you know, uh, or, or just a, a really like I guess how people really love a certain kind of cheese or something like that. Like that's, that's my thing. So, yeah, no, I and I and I, and I just have one a day so it's not like you know i'm drinking coffee all day long or something like that i'm a good caffeine metabolizer i found that out through my testing how do you know that yeah what you can do is um you have these like genetic generators that used to i don't this has been a while back but 
it, it takes your data off of uh, 23andMe, and it it takes takes some more, uh, does another calculation, and it shows where you're at with caffeine. And I'm a fast caffeine metabolizer, which I pretty much knew, because I can, I don't, I don't even do caffeine in the morning. I do it in the afternoon, and I mean, truth be told, if I don't do if I don't do espresso at all, I'm probably going to sleep really good, but I sleep great, even though I do have an afternoon espresso. I get it pretty, pretty metabolized mm-hmm. by the time I go to bed. I'm a late night person, so. Okay, okay. So you do a whole genome sequencing, and then whatever that whole genome sequencing gives you back then, you can give it to websites and we'll this was probably like circa like 2014 or something like that. So I'm not quite sure. I wouldn't even know how to approach it now. I heard it. I heard about through a podcast, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm going to go take my data from 23andMe and put it through this generator. And it gave some interesting information. And the only thing I remember from it was the caffeine thing. Uh, and I don't even know how good that data is off of 23andMe, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Now we've got, you know, we've got like the true diagnostic test, um, which you know, the science is completely different, I'm sure. So yeah, so so the true diagnostic is epigenetics. Twenty uh, three me is genetics, right? Genetics doesn't change over the years, but epigenetics changes all the time. What are you juicing with? <laughs> what <laughs> supplements do you ah. do you take next to your diet? Some yoga secrets. <laughs> really good ones for me are um I'm a poor methylator. I've got that lovely homozygous uh MTHFR mutation. So I need those methyl groups. So I'm doing trimethylglycine, which is really really good for me. I'm doing internal hyaluronic acid. Really good for you know, hair, skin, that kind of stuff, but good for... for... Internal? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Well, uh, the reason I say that is because skincare people, we know about hyaluronic acid from our serums. It's a very um, uh-huh. common ingredient, but I take it a supplement, hyaluronic acid. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, along with collagen, hydro- hydrolyzed collagen peptides. And, um, but my... The one I love absolutely the most, if, you know, you had to take all the rest of them, I would like not let you take this one, is my Glynac, my glycine and N-acetylcysteine. So I I do about 12 to 15 grams a day of glycine, and I do about 600 um, on the NAC. And um, glycine is so good for so many things, muscle retention. Um, mood, so it helps with anxiety, helps with sleep. Um, it's got some brain benefits, and I think also anti-aging. So love taking my uh, glycine. It's like a I have to like I'll pack it, and you know tr- when I travel. Um, I I supplement D D three and um, and magnesium at night you know, to help with sleep. And also I am, well, I, sh- I can be subject to migraines, but with the magnesium and with the NAC, the N-acetylcysteine, I'm able to basically almost like eliminate them. Like I, I'm not getting them anymore, which is great. Yeah. Does that sound like a lot? I don't, it, to me, it doesn't feel like a lot compared to you know, a lot of people in the space. It doesn't feel like a lot. Good. No. <laughs> that, that sounds good, yeah. You see, I have two kind of um, supplements. One is the core supplements that I believe that these are good things that I take. And the other kind of supplement that I just, I hear about it on some podcast and I'm like, okay, let's order a <laughs> bottle, like whatever. I just, until it, it runs out, unless I hear about it again, then I order it again. Like, I have no idea if this helps or makes me worse. But but since I'm doing this rejuvenation Olympic stuff, I'm hearing a lot of 
things and I'm buying a lot of things. Oh, I bet. I know, right? So, yeah. I've been there. Yeah, I've I've bought a lot of supplements over over time. De- definitely. And we do that with skincare too. We watch other people, a uh, skincare people and then we're like, "Oh, I have to try that." Oh, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, okay, so hyaluronic acid collagen supplements, right? They are great for skin or so they say. And that's another thing that base. I'm sorry to interrupt. That's yep. another thing that glycine does. It helps us generate collagen. So it's like it's I'm bullish on glycine. It's 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 amazing. It's cheap too. Mm-hmm. It's cheap. That's where I wanted to go. To glycine. So so collagen and hyaluronic acid is in my base supplements, but glycine is something that I it's so in the zeitgeist, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I never looked into it myself. So that's that's probably the thing that I'm considering putting to from my, you know, sometimes I buy it and I have it and I take it without really giving it much thought to, hey, let's put it to my my core supplement. Yeah. So sell me. Glycine <laughs> or Glynac. Yeah, I don't even Glynac, know what's the difference. <laughs> no, because Glynac, when you add in that NAC, um, now you've got the perfect combination for creating your own glutathione in house. So I used to, back in the day, I used to spend a lot of money to get that liposomal glutathione, exogenous glutathione. So you're taking glutathione. The problem is, this is what I understand is that you, you take in the glutathione and there's, there's no real um, organization to where that's going to go, right? But if you're making your own glutathione in the body, then it sort of has these pathways of where it needs to go and where it needs to be sent, right? So it just seems like the, 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 the better way to go is to Plus, we don't really know how much glutathione we're absorbing. But if you're making it, I have more confidence that if it's made in my body, my body's going to know what to do with it, you know, signaling wise. So glycine all by itself, I think is great. And I used to do that, just that. But then when I heard about, learned about the glynac combination and how it increases glutathione, so that master antioxidant it is helping with that reactive oxygen species in the body. It's basically, that's the anti-aging part that I can understand. It's, it's working against that oxidative stress that is basically aging us. So you've got that. You've got the neuroprotective parts of it. It really does help with anxiety. If you have any problem with sleep, it helps, with it. It helps amazingly uh, for me with that. I get it in the powder form and put it into just a little bit of water and it has a little sweet flavor. So it's very easy to take um, and helps with collagen synthesis, which we obviously is lovely for skin, but it's also good for our bones, you know, joints, connective tissue. And um, I think there are some cognitive benefits with glycine too. It's a good one. It's an OG for sure. The N-acetylcysteine, from what I understand, no expert, uh, but they have they discovered with long COVID patients that it was really beneficial for respiratory stuff. So, in acetylcysteine, I guess because it has that antioxidant effect, really, really good if you're prone to any of that, or you're certainly trying to get through a respiratory thing. But I just like to stay on it. Some people when they're feeling ill, like they feel like they might be getting something, they'll up their inositalcysteine, you know, with the glycine. So it's a good one. Both of them are very affordable in terms of some of the crazy, you know, costs of supplements. So it's a good one. Did I sell you? It's a good, <laughs> maybe, but I will do my own research. Of course. Just to be sure. I would have it no other way. Let me branch into the next topic here. I've been taking magnesium before sleep, and there was a time when I changed my magnesium supplement, and that magnesium supplement, 
you see, I very rarely notice any effects from any supplements. I'm not tuned into my body like a yoga guru or someone. So, but, but I, I noticed caffeine, I noticed creatine, right? And I noticed this magnesium supplement change. When I changed my magnesium supplements before sleep, then it, it completely shuts down my brain. Ooh. And the reason is because there are other things in that supplements, right? It's got sleep magnesium, but it has GABA, I think, alanine and glycine, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so ever since I'm taking glycine, but I never like optimize the dose, um, stuff like that. Um, so which brings us to the next topic. How do you sleep? Do you sleep well? I do. I sleep well, uh, which is saying a lot <laughs> um, because I, I definitely, it's something that is always, I, I think I can remember kind of lifelong sort of struggling with sleep. You know how like some people can just sleep anywhere and sleep through everything. And I am not that person. Uh, so with all of my, you know, practices, uh, including LED, my LED light, light panel, I feel like really helps me um, with sleep too. In fact, I've been doing it in the evening, which is really interesting, that it's lovely. Um, and, um, and the What's other thing, that? do you red know? Red light? Yeah, red light. Red light and near infrared. So I have a panel. Uh -huh. And um, of course, we love it for its skincare benefits, but it's also really, really good for, you know, lots of things, mitochondrial charging and our eyes and eye health. And um, I somehow, something, it helps me sleep well. The other thing, though, I should mention in there is hormonal supplementation, because if I did not do that, who knows about sleep? Because, of course, hormones have so much to do with sleep. And so I am, so I mentioned my uh, recurrent pregnancy losses in my 30s. I've always, looking back now, I realize I've always had this, these hormonal imbalances. And once I started, I use, um, I use a, a program called the Wiley Protocol, and it's a supplemental creams. So I do it transdermally, and it is bioidentical hormone replacement. What the, what the Wiley protocol does is it seeks to replace hormones. So it's a hormone replenishment program, and it seeks to optimize hormones at about a 30-year-old level. So it's not just give you a little dib and dab because you're postmenopausal and let's just barely give you anything, but I am at a robust, you know, hormone level. And it's great for sleep. It's wonderful. And anxiety. And, and the, long, the reason I do it, and of course it's one of those things that I pay out of pocket and there's, you know, no insurance covering that, is because of the long-range benefits with cognitive, cardiac, bone density, muscle density, all of that. Um, so I supplement with progesterone, estradiol, and a little bit of testosterone. DHEA? I used to do. I used to do DHEA. That's a good one. I used to do it. I always do creams. That's my thing. I don't like taking hormones uh, orally because I don't like them going through the liver. just don't like that idea. And the idea of a transdermal um, delivery to me just feels right. And I used to do the DHEA... I was doing the mimicking of, um, you know, Greg Fahey and his his um, thymic rejuvenation study where he oh, was yeah. using DHEA, HGH. Now, I wasn't using HGH, but I, I was doing the practices that encourage HGH. I still do, you know, intermittent fasting, fasted um, cardio, hot and cold exposure therapy, all those things will help with our HGH. We really want to optimize it while we're sleeping. Oh, amino acid stacking. That, that's another one of my kind of go-tos. That's one thing I've done for a very long time is um, 
just, you know, a good stack of branch chain amino acids, um, including leucine. And um, yeah, one I really like. It helps me hide. It tastes good and it helps me hydrate. But I, 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 because I can only eat so much, um, and sometimes it's hard to get in those, you know, mm -hmm. ample amounts of amino acids. I like to also do um, a stack, a nice stack of amino acids on top of the glycine. So the glycine goes, you know, I, I'll just. There's usually glycine in those stacks, but I don't. I don't even really count that. I'll, I'll still do more glycine on top of that. Um, so, yeah, and that's another thing. I, I think that will um, help us secrete HDH is um, a combination of certain amino acids. At least that's what I, you know, started doing about 12 years ago. Yeah. Okay. Okay. What's your what's your routine leading up to sleep is like? Yeah, so when I get done with work, I I like to have I work I work from home now, you know, ever since lockdown. Um I always used to work in an office, but after lockdown it just didn't make any sense to go back to an office. Um so I like to make this you know, when you work from home, you know, I'd like to make this sort of change point between, you know, I'm sitting here at my desk and, you know, now I'm in the, you know, enjoyable evening, you know, personal part of my day. Um, so, you know, bathing and skincare and, you know, sort of practices like that to, to sort of transition into the evening and, uh, uh, you know, enjoy kind of making something, some sort of a good meal and lately I've been doing my red light therapy so I'll do like a device I'll do like some microcurrent you know um, skincare device put some serum on sit sit in front of my LED panel um, and audiobooks I so I, I definitely like the idea of separating from a device in the evening and I turn my 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 phone on to um, you know, airplane mode, try not to have like Wi-Fi right next to my head. But I do enjoy listening to an audiobook because it is sometimes hard to get, you know, the mind to stop. And if I'm listening to a story, and I always make sure it's a very sort of not that interesting kind of very you know, it's a just, story. Yeah, just nothing really. You know, it's not like a mystery, and it's not anything to figure out. No problem solving. It's just very simple. Somebody at the beach, you know, just very simple, like a beach read. Um, and I usually will just go right to sleep, you know, listening to that story. So that's my sort of calm, calm app or something. Um, that's what I do. Yeah. Okay. Um, one one thing I noticed. Have you tried to read before sleep? Um, I used to back when we read books. <laughs> uh, now it's more like listening, listening to a book. Uh -huh. um, but that's a, that is a good one, though. So I, I'm, I've been wondering because that's the go-to advice everywhere that you have to read before sleep. Oh, I see. But uh, I've been doing these experiments on myself that, you know, what I notice is that when you're reading, you're trying to your brain has to work much harder than let's say watching a movie um even like okay so if you watch a movie before sleep then you want to put on some red light filters or something mm -hmm. but but that's a passive thing you just sit there and it's happening but for reading you have to focus and concentrate and read and understand it's a much more involved thing. So I found for myself, reading is not the right thing to do. Although audio book, I, I recently got onto what the Fountainhead from mm. Ayn Rand. <laughs> it's a very, very long audio book. That's oh, what very I'm nice. reading now. Movement. I am working out every morning for like 10 minutes. I always change what I'm, what my workout is. And I do the same before at night, not before sleep, but before shower. 
and that's 10 minutes as well, but it's more like some stretching. And every week I change what I'm doing. So the next seven week I'm doing yoga and I just started this week and I always change what kind of yoga I am doing, right? So one week, one kind of yoga. And the first week I, I decided to do Bikram yoga <laughs> and I just, okay, what is this thing? And I'm looking it up and wow, that guy is something. So tell me about Bikram and the million dollar drop of sperm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I know that the you know? one time I accidentally ended up in a Bikram room, I I felt trapped. I wanted to run from that room. Is that isn't that the one where they do a very set of movements? Yes. Oh, so hard. I I I I I'm more used to a vinyasa, a flow. Bikram is not 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 my vibe. It's it feels so. I don't know something about maybe I need to do it because it's it's one of those things where like if you re- hate it you probably need it but it feels so restrictive and vinyasa is this flow and you're moving and it's hard but um, so different I think yeah I, I like uh, the idea of of what you're doing I, I'm I'm kind of doing a similar thing um, where I'm I, I'll go from plyometrics one day to hit to certainly weight training um and i always this is what i've been doing lately i start out with a uh, i think of it as my four minute pill pill and i do a four minute tabata and and i'm talking about just all out you know like breathing is hard so it's like it's like a wake up you know it's, it's like one you know i get up and rinse you know, mouthwash and a few things and then just boom, just like do it. And then what I'm going to do later, okay, yeah, I'll do, a, I'll do leg day. I'll do, you know, I'll do, you know, three supersets, whatever. Um, but I get that, like that just rush of high intensity, you know, jolt. And it feels so good. Like it's, it is, it's an, it's an amazing, um, mood lifter and you just you know feels great i'm a less is more kind of with kind of like what you're you know what you're like um you know minimal dosage maximal (laughs) benefit hopefully um i've been all over the board like every decade i feel like i did something different between like you know jazzercise and step class and spin class and long distance cycling and then trail running and then a decade of yoga and now I'm in my decade of like um kind of like hybrid sort of like keeping the body guessing I definitely impact stuff for bone density um weight bearing or or, or weight training for sure just for all those benefits um and some high intensity stuff, some plyometrics, you know, some cardio, uh, but I don't feel like I have to do a lot, or maybe I just don't want to do a lot of cardio, but, um, what about now? That's, that's pretty much what it looks like now. Like I'll get up, I'll do that four minute Tabata and then I'll, I'll do some supersets if I'm, if I'm weight training or I'll do, um, you know, sometimes I'll do some yoga, um, or um, continue and do, you know, some more, like 12 more minutes of hit or something like that. And just keep it always changing um, because I get bored and I don't want to do the same, you know, you know, Brian Johnson's routine, like, is very methodical and he's doing like literally, I would go into a coma. I, I, I've got to, you know, like change it up and, um just have something different to to look forward to but i'll do like splits i'll i'll make sure i do like a leg day a back day a push a pull basically i'm not going to the gym right now my youngest went back to college so i don't really like going to the gym by myself so but i'll do weights at home 
Well, where do you do all these things? You mentioned you work in home office, so you're basically home all yeah. the time. <laughs> I am. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I am. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. It works. Uh yeah. I'm not at all like, okay. yeah, it, it's, I mean, it was, it was terrible during lockdown. Right. But, um, yeah, I've just really, you know, created a routine and a atmosphere and, you know, uh, I enjoy it. Yeah. I, I'm doing the same. So preaching to the core <laughs> of all the things that we mentioned, where do you have to exercise the most willpower? Um, I guess I should probably go with the first thing that came to my mind is like, yeah, eating, <laughs> you know, snacking. Um, of course. I have a really good appetite, you know. I it, I control my calories. It's not it's not that I, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, I could care less. I'm like, no, I love, I love eating. You know, eat, snacking on something at night not sound good when you're like watching, you know. I'm watching Love is Blind or something. I'm like, yeah, it'd be great to be snacking. And I mean, sometimes, you know, if I really feel like I'm like really hungry for some reason, I'll go, okay, well, I'll, you know, have some nuts or I'll have some, you know, I'm like, maybe I worked out harder today. You know, I'm not going to totally deny myself. But um, yeah, just um, calorie restriction kind of sucks sometimes, you know, but the reality is that you know, I have to control that um, if, you know, to to be able to work on the, the body composition that I seek to have, you know, and maintain. So I did you think know, of since some... I started. Oh, go ahead. Since I started asking this question, everyone choose not nutrition. Oh, do they? <laughs> but go on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, yeah, food is good. Well, go and change your mind. What else did you think? Uh, in that case, what else do I have? Oh, I thought oh, you I'm were going to say something. I went back. I just remembered when you said, what haven't you done? There was one thing I was going to talk about. Um, just because it comes up, and especially as a female on the Internet, it, as a woman who's over 40 on the Internet, it comes up. Um, and, it, and it does come up now in the anti-aging space is um, cosmetic procedures, even now veneers, you know? Um, so, uh, there's so there's a lot of people doing that now. Uh, Brian Jones. What? Veneers, teeth, getting all your teeth shaved down and putting new ones, you know, these celebrity smiles. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's fine. People can choose their 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 own choices when it comes to their aesthetic and what to do with their body, of course. But I don't have, I don't use fillers. I don't use Botox. I haven't had any plastic surgery. Um, and I don't, these are my teeth. <laughs> um, they're not <laughs> perfect. They don't look like celebrity teeth. So uh, I don't think any of those things contribute to health and age reversal or slowing aging down. In fact, I really am concerned about the injection of fillers. I think that's, um, I wouldn't want to do that um, uh, health-wise. And also Botox, and uh, because it's a toxin. And, um, and, you know, doing something to the teeth to just cosmetically, you know, so I just, I don't, I, I, those things I have avoided. Um, not that I, I never tried it. I, I did try um, Botox probably like 10 years ago, and I did try some, some fillers, which is now completely, uh, uh, it's outdated. It's not even a, a, a procedure that is effective. There's much better things you can do, like PRP under your eyes or something like that. But um, I would rather put my money into or my time and my energy into things that actually contribute to my health. So that was a thought that I had. It comes up. That, that's interesting. I've been, I just started thinking about this and... I came to a decision, but I'm only 33, so I'm probably going to change my mind on this <laughs> at some point. As you can. But the first thing that that happened to me is the I started to have some 
gray hair in my bear. Sure. And now I was thinking, okay, so what do people do? Well, should I start to color it or not? And I decided to not color it. And the reason is, is because if I color my beard, color my hair to, to, to change the gray or, 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 or the same, you know, I mean, like my, my hair is, is coming out. Right. And if I put, put new hair into that, that doesn't change my ph physiology. Right. And in fact, that masks the, the symptoms of aging. Yeah. So the success could be measured by the gray hair or by the, the hair that I'm growing back, which by the way, I'm doing good progress with it. And I know what microneedling is because oh. I'm doing that. <laughs> and it's good. It's good for that. I do that too. I don't know, I, but I, I do, maybe. Yeah, I do microneedling with um, uh -huh, growth factor uh -huh. in the scalp just to make sure that, you know, to try to help keep my hair from getting thinner and just the aging process. Yeah. No, I would stick with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so I'm doing um, finasteride. Um, what's the minoxidil that you put mm -hmm. it on? Yeah. yeah. Microneedling and laser therapy oh, laser baseball helmet? Headset. No, that's, that works. <laughs> yeah. That's good. I, that's really good. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know which one works, but one of it is working. Good. <laughs> well, I think minoxidil really, really does work, but I have a laser, actually I have a laser face mask, but I put it on my scalp. And um, so it's basically the same thing that you're doing. And I find it really really works what we usually can see is we'll see like these baby hairs you know coming in like new growth but yeah but see the thing is is like it, it being male I, I don't you know you can obviously I'm sure you know your wife's opinion but most of us women we love the way men age we're here for it all day get the gray it looks distinguished to, you know I, I would much rather see this natural aging process than the guy who's like doing Botox. And I mean, I think an aging male is a lovely. Now it's, it's a, it, culturally we have a little bit of a difference with, with females and um, it's unfortunate that a lot of females get kind of, they, they can't win, you know, sort of if they do plastic surgery, they get a lot of scrutiny. And if they don't do any, then they get a lot of scrutiny for, you know, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough thing. But um, most men are, um, I don't know, I, I, I experience they're allowed to age and that we kind of celebrate it. And I think that's a good thing. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't dye the mm. beard. It's an interesting thought. Women are in a, not, nothing's good. <laughs> it's like whatever you do is, yeah. Kind of. Although the scrutiny, if you're doing the plastic stuff, the scrutiny is coming from one place, place but right. Not, so it's just polarizing. Yeah. It's a, some, some people really going to like it. Like, I don't mind at all. Right. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Question. So. You're you're really into the skincare stuff. Um, what should I do for skincare? Because I'm really not into it. So just just one oh one basic kickoff starter pack. Starter pack, a hundred percent. Do you use SPF? A what? Sun protection factor. Are you using a sunblock? Um, no. No. How much time are you? <laughs> how much time are you in the sun? And not much. Not much. Like very little i mean i would say the best thing that you can do is your wife into skincare no no okay <laughs> the best thing you could do is to get a really lovely i love korean uh sunscreen because the the korean blends are so easy it just feels like a nice little moisturizer so it feels like you're just putting you know a moisturizer on your skin but it's getting, you know, any sun that's coming through the window, when you're out in the car, the number one thing that damages our skin is UV 
damage. If we didn't have UV damage, our skin doesn't age hardly at all. It's going to age from reactive oxygen species and a few other things. But if we can avoid sun damage, then we're avoiding like 90% of, you know, kind of like the aging process. Now, it doesn't look like you've got, from what I can see on the screen, it doesn't look like you've got much sun damage. So that's great. I mean, I grew up in California, I have lots of freckles and, you know, sunspots and, and all of that. So that's one thing. And, you know, so putting that on daily and protecting from, from the sun. And I mean, for you, like if you did something like just a nice salicylic wash, you look like somebody who might have like a little bit of a little, little oily skin or combo skin. Your skin is, I think so. is not dry. Someone said it before. Yeah, yeah. Which is good. That's a good thing. I have dry skin. I would love to have oily skin because oily skin ages really well because you, you've got those extra, you know, uh, sebaceous glands and stuff. So, um, but if you had like a just a nice little um, salicylic acid wash, gives you just a little bit of clarifying when you're cleansing. And then if you did a vitamin C serum, your skin would just, just you would just notice like clearing, you know, like if you get like blackheads or whiteheads or anything like that, it sort of tends to clear those and gives you sort of more of a bounce and a shine or a glow. And the vitamin C is an ingredient that the skin can use to help generate collagen. So that's a good one. You you put the vitamin C on your yeah, skin. Yeah, so it's not like a serum. It. Yeah, like uh -huh. a hyaluronic, like a hyaluronic acid serum with some vitamin C in it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Just a few things. Yeah. I will. I will really <laughs> listen to this because I'm not <laughs> sure I caught everything. <laughs> just just some reflection on the sun stuff. You know, people always get very surprised when Elon Musk is taken a photo with the, on a boat or Mark Zuckerberg and they are like as white as a vampire, you know, like, because they are working all the time. Right. Now I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, because the politicians look down the entire work, entire world, I decided to buy a nice place uh, next to my hometown and, 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 and be in a lockdown in a nice place instead of stuck in a big city, you know, a small apartment. Then, then there is a problem in the summer for me because altogether for around six months, I cannot go out because of seasonal allergies. Oh, right. right. So I had to figure out how to, how to, how to do the light lighting environment you know circadian lighting try to mm -hmm. like i even have reflector reflectors doing so so i have a lot of a lot of light in the in the morning and stuff like that and um and i just got the the red light therapy device so maybe that will make a make a difference can't we'll hurt see. can't hurt yeah so so regarding sun i have a sunscreen but I, I very rarely go out and I, I just keep wondering that I'm going out so rarely that should I really put on the sunscreen or is it better to just absorb that little UV or something that I'm not getting inside? Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And I think, you know, it is good for us to get, I mean, this is what we hear, right? Huberman, you know, says, go, go out and get a little bit of sun. I, I think, you know, try not to do it midday. You might be get some of those benefits, though, from your red light panel. Uh, some of the benefits that, you know, you're missing out from the sun. One more thing you could try for your seasonal allergies. Some, some people have good luck with taking quercetin. Have you tried doing quercetin? No, it's interesting. I thought I already heard all the ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I hear quercetin can help with, um, with allergies, or at least it, it has for um, a few, few people that I know. Uh, and it's easy enough to take because it's just an antioxidant. 
and it's yeah so you could try that um, definitely definitely yeah. cuz allergy medications are awful yeah i mean I, I do kind of i do kind of i mean not to be cynical but i do i do sort of treat the world as it is toxic because it kind of is so you know I'm, i um i don't drink the tap water and uh, i don't care if it's got a filter on it that's that's it's terrible at least where I live, like it's not good water where I live. Uh, I live, you know, close to Silicon Valley. It's, this is not good water, um, the, the municipal water. Um, and, um, you know, the air is not great. And, you know, maybe it's better that we are working out indoors. Cause we just, you know, <laughs> it's getting a little worse and worse. Um, yeah, I mean, I think your practices are good, and uh, hopefully you could figure out a way to, or if the quercetin helped, you could, you know, go and enjoy some time outdoors, but I don't, I think you're all right, um, yeah. and, and I think get, getting a little bit of sun, I mean, you you know, you, you definitely don't look like somebody who's had the kind of sun exposure that a lot of people, you know, men notoriously get it through the scalp and stuff, which is really bad when you start later in life worrying about skin cancer and stuff like that I... when i was young getting sunburned was like a regular occurrence you know mm, same <laughs> yeah i do go to the dermatologist once a year for a skin check even though i don't have a family history of skin cancer but just because you know i've had this i, I don't get it anymore but i i've had a lot of sun exposure in my life and so i just think we got to keep on top of that and and um tretinoin can and that's a topical vitamin a cream that you know a lot of skincare people use and that can actually help remove some sun damage it's anti you know anti-aging helps with fine line and wrinkle, lines and wrinkles and can even help prevent some skin cancers from continuing to go develop Further. So that's one other thing you could add to your skincare list is you wouldn't even need, need to do a, a tretinoin. You could just do a retinol, an over-the-counter retinol um, serum treatment. Okay, and where do I put that? Um, it would Everywhere? be yeah, and for for all of your exposed, like so you know if if you've gotten sun exposure up into the scalp, you know, oh, you know what. It also is, I think, being shown to help with, with, with hair growth. So when I put on my tretinoin, I bring it up right up into the hairline, you know, because I, I think there's some studies now showing that it can help. So, so if you have you gotten some sun, sun damage, that's one thing that you can do to help that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you can use All that right. with your vitamin C. So it's, they, they can be used together. One one thing that occurred to me, it's uh, I'm pr pretty sure you guys don't think about this, but for people with bigger bodies have a lot more skin, <laughs> so <laughs> it takes a lot more time to to use the creams for us than to you guys. Anything extra that you're doing that we didn't talk about yet? I'm not currently doing it, but I I I did go through a a little era of um, ozone treatment. Have you ever heard of ozone treatment? Yes, but what kind of the blood intravenous goes out and mm -hmm. uh -huh. so I did some of that back in like you know 2015, 2016. Some people, you know, you go for an infusion, and some people they'll do they'll do NAD in there or glutathione or something like that. It was expensive. I don't think I could afford those things, but I did do the ozone and ozone is really 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 cool um i've also gotten ozone injections uh for i have a i did do about 10 years of long distance cycling so i have a, a toe joint that is is very you know it's got like a bone spur and it's you know it's got overuse injury to it and i had some ozone injected there a few times and it's really cool it's it's sort of like um, some of the effects of PRP, which I've also done, um, where it brings, you know, healing and circulation and, you know, the growth factor, you know, signaling the growth factors to come in and basically help your body uh, 
you know, generate. Uh, I, I've actually learned recently that bone spurs can actually be reabsorbed. So, you know, I thought it was one of those things like, oh, yeah, bone spur. Oh, that's it. You know, that's you're stuck, you know, kind of thing. And it's like, no, you know, we can actually heal a lot of those things. And so, um, yeah, so I've done ozone in the past. I'm probably going to think of something something odd that I do that I, I can't think of right now. It's a lot of skincare. It's my extra, it's my extra routines, but yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, maybe that's what making the difference here. Oh, that's a good point. I, uh, that I brought, um, I am using Synolytics in skincare. So there's a couple of companies now that are doing Synolytics in skincare. And there is something to be said about that. So, um, you know, skin is our largest organ. And I do spend a lot of time applying, you know, yeah, certain of them are, are perhaps more, more topical. But when you're using a synolytic, there is, you know, it's, it's getting into the system. I mean, I know that from my topical hormone replacement. That certainly is changing my whole system just by using a a topical. So the senolytics are going in and doing senescent cell clearing. So, you know, I think I feel like skin care is more health care than we think. You know, I don't think of it as just a, I mean, yes, it's fun. And yes, you know, we love to have that glowy skin. But I also think that it is addressing you know, overall health, immune system. And if, if some of these, one of the ones that I use is a body lotion that has, you know, the senolytic or the senescent clearing peptide in it. And if I'm clearing senescent cells topically, you know, over the whole body, it seems like a pretty good thing if it's, you know, in fact, doing what we think it's doing. So... It's an inter interesting theory. Maybe someone who's listening gonna <laughs> gonna try it and report back. Let's think small. Do you have any very small things? Those are very practical and making a very small difference, and you love it. Like a suggestion, a biohack for for someone listening here. I love that term. It feels so old school now. Um, xylitol do you use xylitol i, I never, never heard, heard of it so xylitol is a natural sugar it comes from trees um and it is one of those sugars that doesn't you know spike your blood and you got to be careful you can't eat too much of it. it can cause tummy you know disruptions but xylitol for dental for our oral microbiome so i use a xylitol rinse every day i use xylitol um, toothpaste and xylitol mints and they help support a good microbiome. And so I stopped using things like Listerine and um, I, I haven't used fluoride in a long time. I don't, I don't think fluoride's too good for us. Um, I think we were, you know, sold a bill of goods on that one. So, um, so um, xylitol for oral health. And then I use a xylitol nasal spray. And um, what it does is it not only moistens the the mucous membrane, which we want, that's what we want to stave off viruses and bacteria, but the xylitol helps it sort of, for lack of a better term, from catching. So it can really, like if I'm going to travel, I mean, I'm definitely going to take my xylitol nasal spray. I'm going to keep, you know, using it. If I'm going to be in a concert or something around people, I'm going to definitely use that for immune, you know, support, basically. So xylitol okay um that raises a question in me so so there are some ways that people can de deliver supplements for themselves like orally or what you're big on putting it on your skin right but there is also one that i don't see i actually don't really know anyone from this rejuvenation crowd to be doing that which is through your lungs, through a nebulizer, Oh, right? right? And I was doing that a lot when I was young. So now I restarted it and nebulizing some salts and, and, and looking up what other things I can nebulize, you know? So 
would that be something that might be like worth trying? Yeah, that's interesting. I think as long as you felt good about the ingredients, because I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're finding out like as innocuous as vaping seem to be or in the, you know, when we were first looking at it, they're finding out like, oh, it's not really good for you. So I, I guess I'm a little weary of um, taking something into the lungs. However, here I am like, you know, doing this nasal spray. So it's like not a lot different, right? So um, I, I actually haven't heard about that. So I don't know what are they what are they applying like antioxidants or anything like that or. Uh, so, so saline solution, yeah, right? Okay. Like people can mess with how much salt they put in the water, and then there are a bunch of other kind of things like there is this salvus water in Hungary. And it has a bunch of minerals in it, oh. and this is for nebulizing. So, so that that just gives you six other things that, uh, in theory, safe to nebulize. Uh, that people do silver, some mm. some peroxide. I don't know something like that. So, so but but it's really interesting. I mean, it's not that many things, but it's a completely new mechanism that people can taking supplements and it's so underexplored that it yeah. just intrigues me at yeah, this no, point. I, I yeah. see why. It'd be kind of like when you go into a steam bath, you know, you're breathing in this vapor, right? This yeah. steam. So it seems like, yeah, that could be a good delivery method. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Now, let me ask you the contrarian question. What's one thing that you strongly believe to be the case, but very few people agree with you on? So unpopular opinion. I'm sure I've got one. I know what unpopular is, or what people don't like to hear is the whole like calorie restriction thing. But it does seem to me that when we ask our body to do too much a lot, over and over and we're taxing the system so i think of that like with overabundance of taking in a whole lot of supplements and asking the system to because it does have to go right to our liver whatever flush out but also like like even if you were like juicing which is could be healthy but if you were you know just didn't I, I guess I guess I that's that's where that sort of more cautious side is like I, I go on this side of like I'll do less. Like if I get if I am gonna try out a new supplement and I'll just I'll do half of what they say and then I'll start there or something like that. Just because I feel like the body probably just doesn't wanna take on like a lot of anything. That seems intuitively that seems aging to me. Now, there might, there might be something that I do a lot of in someone's opinion, but I, I, I guess that's kind of how I think about it. It's like, just do less, you know, just try not to do too much of even a good thing. What's your trade? Why should people give you money? Why should people give me money? For, for what? <laughs> for... Um, <laughs> for just to give you some context, this is my final question. This is always my final question. The reason is that you see we exist in a society and the coordination mechanism in between us is the marketplace. So you create some value and you bring that value to that marketplace, the abstract marketplace of the world and you exchange that value with other people. So my question to you is, why should people give you money, value? That's so interesting. Oh gosh, that's such an interesting question. Um, I guess I'm trying to think about it in a sense of like, why would I want to give someone else their money value? And that would be because I value um, 
you know, what they've done. Um, and what they sort of offer. And I think the the most fundamental thing that somebody could offer is their best self. You know, like, um, here I am, uh, six decades in, and I am trying my my path or um, aim has been to to continue to develop myself in the best way, you know, for my sons and for the people that I affect and for the people that I can help. And so if we all did that, I just wonder, you know, how much different the world would be if we all, you know, it kind of goes to that thing where I don't know if you've gotten that, but again, as a female on the internet, you get, um, oh, you're very self-centered and look at all the time you spend on yourself and why would you spend so much money on this and what's, you know, just let yourself get old and let yourself age graceful or whatever, all these comments. If everyone took such exquisite care of themselves, how different could, you know, would people be so angry and war-minded and hurt and violent if they took such exquisite care so because i take such good care of myself <laughs> that's the answer uh, that, that's such a great answer and i hate to do this but i want to bring this to more more call to call to action uh way of of of, of expressing you so my understanding is that you are working at home and doing consultations, right? So if I'm correct with my speculation, then people should be able to contact you and take your goods and services. Yeah, yeah, I hire you for, for, for things. So tell tell the listeners how can they reach out to you? Or is is my is it even correct? That no, I'm it's saying, a correct yeah. assumption. I I am a private. I'm in private practice, and I and I provide mental health services. I am so fortunate that I uh, I'm not really looking for for um, more business. Although I you know I I can't say I'm completely closed, but I I, don't, I couldn't promise that I would be able to see. Um, people who are reaching out. But what I really, uh, and, and I love that work, uh, and I can, you know, put that out there. But what I really, my uh, passion side project is content creation. And I'm starting a new channel, Self Care by Share, on YouTube. And I'd love to see it um, grow. And um I love doing that. So much fun. And I love connecting and, um, you know, hearing from people through there. Um, therapy is a whole different, you know, part of my life. And luckily, it kind of runs itself at this point. I'm a, you know, I'm a, a licensed practitioner. So people see me through their insurance. And sometimes people pay me out of pocket and that kind of thing. Um, so I will definitely send you um, my 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 channel info and i'm yoga girls world on instagram if anybody wants to find me there not that i'm on there very much but share that was a unique episode i was wondering if anyone can show me some new things and you certainly oh, did oh i love it so thank you very much for that i learned from you too yeah it was a pleasure and some great questions very thought-provoking i would like to think so, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs>